So please tell me a bit about your experiences of working online, particularly um, during COVID-19. Okay. Uh, actually, for me, it's been great. I am low income uh, and I was having to commute at just ridiculous hours in the morning. I was getting up at quarter to five and getting into the office at seven and seeing clients um, and paying for that room. Uh, and it was part of my routine. I thought not, nothing of it. We prepared, my clients and I prepared to work online. We knew this was coming. Um, and we transitioned into online work smoothly. Uh, there was a moment of about a week, two weeks for some people where, despite the presentation, they um, had to deal with other stuff. And so my practice collapsed for about a week, which made my hair stand on end. Everybody disappeared. I thought we had prepared, but actually, how do you prepare for something that no one living can remember? Um, but then people came back pretty quickly. In that in the first two weeks, I offered a space to other therapists, uh, Monday to Friday from eight till nine. And a lot of therapists came online to uh, just talk about how they were feeling. And what really struck me was how de-skilled so many people felt. The, these are adult people. Um, many of them older than me, I'm 55, with great experience, on the phone to me saying, I don't know how to use the phone, on Skype with me saying, I don't know how to use Skype. And there was something about, uh, I don't have a certificate in this, so I'm not, I can't, I'm not allowed to do this. I don't have a certificate in how to use the phone, so I can't use the phone safely. Uh, now, I don't have any official title, but you know, between us, I was able to say, well, what are the principles? And this goes back to something that Rosie was saying. We need to learn the principles of what we're doing and why we're doing it, not to perform actions that get us through the hour uh, without being sued. We, we have to be able to transfer principles into new situation. So at the time, there was an awful lot of one-upmanship, frankly, around, oh, well, Skype's terribly dangerous. You ought to use Zoom. Well, Zoom is terribly dangerous. You ought to use VC and so on and so on. And this one-upmanship, this, comp this competitive nature was very striking. Um, I don't know if we are more competitive than other groups. I've not been in accountancy groups or teaching groups. But this, well, I know better than you and I'm better qualified than you. It was very striking. So the, there was both that, I am an expert and I am a completely hopeless person, I'm helpless. That, that was more striking to me than the client work, actually. We, we moved over in a fairly straightforward way and I continue to work online with clients and I continue to get clients. It saves us money. It saves us a lot of travel and time. And they are in my home. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I am in their home. And that brings another level of intimacy. Mm -hmm. and that, is, that leads nicely, actually, on something I want to talk about in your political work. You talk about mm -hmm. the commodification of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about that, as Rosie was talking, that move to the the transactional pick up a point you just you just mentioned about the intimacy so um how is it uh, how is this commodification lived out within the profession in your view well it seems to me that a therapist and client and patient have become the batteries they've become the oil or the fuel for different processes uh, so we're taught how to be therapists and that's a long, intense training about empathy and lack of judgment and not lack of judgment, uh, suspending judgment of what the client is saying and so on. And then you're in the real world where agencies need funding. And what's happened in, in agencies, agencies are places run by 
other therapists um, where students get their hours. And the, the clients that we get our hours from are generally people who can't afford private therapy. So they're people with multiple problems. Many of these problems are not going to be solved. The housing problems are not going to be solved. Their lack of money isn't going to be solved. The interface with the DWP and various other services is not going to be solved. That's their problem, but they're coming to counselling uh, because it's somewhere to come and it shows the DWP that they're really ill. Look, I've been to counselling. So it's a, it's a series of performances. And in the agencies, uh, there's a supervisory um, role in there run by qualified therapists who have, are now supervisors often training as supervisors and what used to happen is that agencies could write to funders and say we're worthy please give us money and then outcome measurements came in and we could say we're better than that ther th uh, therapy agency look here are our outcome measures and then every th therapy agency started using outcome measures and what's happened is that those Outcome measures have taken a life of their own. I want to really go back to what Rosie was saying, and I'd like a banner across here going, I'm critiquing the system, not the people. Mm. And just mm. have that continuously running. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Because what I'm saying sounds terrible, and it is terrible, but people feel forced to work in this. And when it comes to funding agencies in a time of never ending austerity, um, funders are now saying we have got to take the, the best care that we can, that this money is being used properly. And they are starting to make demands and funders are now saying we need you to send us your timetable so that we know how many clients you're fitting in per day. And we are setting you targets now. So there's this horrible, um, I can't think of anything not colloquial to say, and I better not say it, but meaning has become really changed. We're not there to help clients anymore. Clients are there to help us get funding. Mm, mm, yes. And I want to move to something you said actually about um, the psychotherapy and counselling world as being cannibalistic. Mm. There's mean? that. There's the ticker tape again. Mm. I'm not saying mm. with we're cannibals. I'm saying the system has made us cannibalistic. So, um, Elizabeth spoke about how many of us work for free. I think it's worth at this moment just looking at some research that the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy did in uh, 2014. They did some re research on who their members are. The BACP are the largest uh, membership group for counsellors and therapists in the UK. There's something like 50,000 members. So the typical counsellor is aged 53, works 12 to 13 hours a week, earns less than £10,000 a year. Yet in marketing terms, as defined in the survey analysis, she falls into the affluent achiever bracket, detached house, luxury car, buys wine and books on the internet, has an iPhone. The disparity between her income and expenditure suggests we can assume she is not the household breadwinner. Just 9% of BACP members earn more than £30,000 a year. 84% of us are female. Mm. Typically, we are the wives of rich men. Yes. Yeah, as Elizabeth was saying, yes. Yeah, so I was going to pick up on that point about mm. about gender, um, and and like I'd like to know more, Claire, about your organising of counsellors and psychotherapists through the psychotherapists and counsellors for social responsibility. Please tell us about that. Well, this organisation's been around for twenty something years now, and like so many of these small fringe organisations. Uh, there's a small membership um, and frankly it's been getting smaller because of the market forces on everybody. Therapists are no longer able to focus on uh, social responsibility or social justice. They've just, we are all in this environment of pressure 
and achievement and performance. And it's really hard now. If I can just go back a step to this cannibalistic stuff, because it feeds into the marketization of what we're doing. It used to be that uh, you could run a training program for, for 10 people, 20 people, and there was a whole swathe of uh, small, intense groups getting a lot of really good work done mm. in training new therapists. But the cost-benefit analysis doesn't work very well when you've got 10 people. Mm. And over the last five or so years, we've been, I mean, it's almost impossible to believe, but it's increasing that there are courses with 70, 70 trainee, yeah, trainees. Um, you just can't do the personal work in that sort of um, environment. The personal work being encounter groups and process groups and supervision groups and peer supervision. And so you, you just can't do it. Now, I know that the people running the, these groups will say, you can and we do, and how dare you? Mm, mm. But I'm going to propose that um, nobody wants to run a group with 70 people in it. It's the money that makes people do this. Mm. There are some very, very good therapists being turned out of these courses. Um, but there are so many of us now that the only way for most, before this happened, the only way for most of us to make any income, because it's all voluntary work through agencies, is that we become supervisors who supervise trainees, who supervise each other, um, or we become trainers who train trainees and hire supervisors. So instead of our work being looking out into the world and how we can see the environment of the uh, client or the patient, we are much more likely to be looking inwards. How do we survive? How do I present myself um, more attractively to uh, supervisees and uh, potential clients? Mm. Exactly, yeah. Um, why do therapists work so incredibly hard, Claire? That's one of the questions mm -hmm. we've got, which I think is a really interesting one. Yeah, we're on zero hours contracts. Mm. And if we don't work, we don't get an income. Mm. The huge majority of us fell outside of the furlough scheme. And um, it's uh, our expenses are massive. Many people go uh, into um, qualified work uh, with £35,000 debt that they've accrued over many years just to and these are you know I was a nurse and a midwife before I started training and I trained right on the edge of this becoming um, much more difficult to functioning so if you don't work you don't get paid mm. Mm. Uh, that can have an impact on the relationship between the client and the therapist but coming back to what Rosie was saying if you have the foundations of why you're doing what you're doing then that can be negotiated. Mm. There's a sort of a, um, um, a cliche in our work that if you can talk about it, it's all right. But if we can't talk about it between the, the client and the therapist, the um, potential for things becoming sticky there can be, can be very realistic. The power imbalance is very great. The need to earn money or the need to make money by any means necessary, particularly these days, it's really powerful. So, you know, we look to IAPT because it gives you the rare um, opportunity for uh, sickness pay or maternity benefits, or, you know, and this sort of thing, because being self-employed, you just don't get it. Uh, and interestingly, we may be tempted to work with the DWP. A lot of work has been done on therapists who work in IAPT, I am not aware of any independent research that's been done on therapists working for the DWP. I know anecdotally of some therapists who've worked with the DWP and it's been catastrophic for them. 
and I'm, I'm not misusing that word. Well, I think I can maybe enlighten you there, Claire. I know I'm not asking the questions, but I, I do. there's a number of us um, in the uh, researchers who know basically that the DWP will not let you do research with their staff. Right. And this is the point that, that we can it. turn to, even if it's publicly funded research, even if it's for the public benefits and it fills a gap in the DWP's own commission mm. research. Um, yes, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the discussion, but it, it is an issue that, that many of us have raised with them that, that may be improving. Um, but having said that, I've just started a piece of research on digital employment services and I'm trying to get access. So we'll see how that goes. Mm. That may be the reason. Um, but I think, to, yeah, it would be interesting to, to know more from people who do research this area mm. whether they have tried to get access and haven't. So thank you, Claire. And I think we'll uh, for raising that. And um, and there's the, some of the questions that I've got for you that I'm going to put into, um, that Elizabeth's going to put into the, the final discussion Mm, section absolutely um, and but there's something that I really want to ask and I know and Elizabeth wants uh, is wants wants me to ask as well which is about inequalities in the consulting room how does this get do these get oh god at? how long have I got <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a quite a serious question how long do you want me to to pitch my answer for um, well, I think if we could make this the last question, um, but um, if we could have more, no more than five minutes, yeah, Claire, okay. sorry, and then we'll move no, to no, the no, that's fine. Okay. Well, the first barrier, the first financial barrier to get through is training costs. Uh, and these can be anything from £2,000 a year just for the training up to something like £15,000 a year. Um, and on top of that, you've got to be able to pay for supervision. You uh, have to pay for travel, childcare, um, personal therapy, which, you know, we all try and make that affordable for students, but you're not going to really get anyone doing it for under £25 a session. And you may need, I don't know, 100 sessions, maybe more, sometimes less. And that's every year mm. for most courses, not for all courses. The people that we train on, and I'm using that phrase, knowing what I'm saying, we practice on the clients in training who are, I think I've said, um, people who can't afford personal therapy. So they are the lowest paid or not paid at all people who have had multiple traumas, people who are really just hanging on. Mm. I think it's worth at this point saying something about the context that we are in uh, and how that matches with employment. So we have been explicitly told that work is good for you. We've been explicitly told that work is a cure for mental ill health. Um, I've been, can you see this? Can you see this picture? Yes. Right. So this was an illustration to an article in Therapy Today, which is the BACP uh, in-house magazine. And this is the, the illustration that went with thing, work is good for you. And I am the godlike figure winding people up broken do you see they're broken they don't know which way is up these poor broken toy things and i wind them up and off they go i don't drop them straight into the blue thing they're just over the void they've got to fight now to stay on the blue working functional part they've got to do it themselves because if they don't they're going to drop into the void wow wow and i i don't know if the if the artist knew what they were doing there but that is so perfect to illustrate the um it's almost a class i don't know any more if it is because that's changed but it's work will set you free with all that that entails mm. it is it's it's absolutely shocking but as people and as therapists and as iapt workers that's our that's the water with 
within which we swim without even knowing that we are swimming. Mm -hmm. So the inequalities within that milieu are massive. 